Hello. Hey, how's it going? Happy New Year. Happy 2024. I can't believe it. Can you believe we're like almost halfway through the third decade of this century? Uh, no, I cannot. <laughs> Time is flying. And I really I mean, thought we'd have like flying cars and stuff by now. <laughs> I did too. Uh, the Jetsons. Yes. You know, I used to, the Jetsons I thought were a thing, you know, for <laughs> we're sure. We're getting closer. My little Volvo right. can do it. Uh, it can drive itself a little bit, but I have to keep my hands on the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. Closer, but come yeah. on. Remember Y2K 25 years ago? Barely. I can't believe that was 25 years ago. Yeah. I mean, oh. we thought like, we don't know if it was going to be electricity right in two minutes nothing's now, gonna you know, work oh my gosh and it you, went by and that to me is a fun memory though because it speaks to what happens in the news all the time it's like <laughs> everything is such a huge deal and the world is coming to an end and in reality it was a blip and we all moved yeah. on and forgot about it that's a good you're, that's a good point like these things that seem so catastrophic you know years later like oh yeah why were we so upset about right that? Yeah. right yeah well, uh, I have good Ollie news. You know, my granddaughter, yes, I have a granddaughter that's in the NICU. She's, she was born prematurely by about three months. In, she um, has fans. August. I know that are listening. Actually, we've had some yeah. feedback and there's so many people out there praying uh -huh. for her. Thank you for that. Yep. So she's born she at one and a half pounds. She's now eight and a half pounds. She's had, she's been in the NICU for like four, five months now. Mm -hmm. She's got two more months to go, but she's had pulmonary hypertension, which uh, it gets caused by, you know, the fact that she was really little and they had to pump oxygen into her lungs. Mm -hmm. And so that damages the lungs, but if they don't do that, she'll die. So that mm -hmm. it's kind of a you know, yeah. mixed blessing. So now she's, she's recovering from it and she's just getting better and better and better. Oh my god! It's gosh, a, miracle. That is a miracle. Modern medicine is just really something. Yes. Thank so you. eventually we're going to get thank this you, little healthy UCSF. baby back. Oh. Yeah, really. Thank you, UCSF. Absolutely. Oh, it's amazing. So welcome to A Place of Possibility. I am Richard Del Monte. I'm Angela Wright. And we're happy to have you with us today on this first episode <laughs> in 2024. So what are we talking about today? So we are spilling some secrets today. Some tea. <laughs> we have a bunch of interesting topics for you, actually. We're going to bounce around a little bit on mm -hmm. three or four things that we think are really important for you to know as we're going into the new year. Yep. As a saver, as an investor, as a human being in the United States of America. Um, yep. And a lot of these, I'm going to call it spilling the tea because a lot of these things are not discussed publicly. I feel like we're Definitely. pulling back the curtain on some Definitely. of these things. Definitely. And we're going to give you our market prediction for 2024. What? We're, we're, we make predictions? You just said that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Call All right. our attorney. <laughs> Can't wait to hear what this is. Speaking no. of, as always, everything <laughs> we say on the show is for educational purposes only. You should absolutely talk to your own advisors uh, before implementing anything that we talk about on this show. And um, if we talk about past performance, it's never a guarantee of future <laughs> results. So let's, why don't you start us off? Okay. So we, uh, there was an article written this past week in the Wall Street Journal by uh, an author named James McIntosh. And he's kind of a commentator and, you know, so-called predictor of the markets, um, which just off the, from that point on, I probably don't like him. I but, roll. but uh, you know, um, so basically he says that the, the, the year that just ended in 2023 just astonished everybody. Nobody predicted the markets were going to be the way they were, as strong as they were, which the S&P was up 24%. Mm -hmm. NASDAQ was like 48, you know, and, and the Dow, the poor measly Dow was up like, I don't know, 12, I think. Poor measly Dow. You know, some little- The think, Dow, as a reminder, the Dow is only the 40 largest stocks in the United- 30. So it's only 30, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 30 largest stocks in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so it's not really a good indicator of the overall health of our markets yeah. or economy, yeah. by the by. Got to be careful because we don't want Benny the fact checker <laughs> <laughs> to come back and say, hey, it's not, not There's just already 30. a text on my phone. I <laughs> um, okay. So anyway, so that we no one predicted these markets. They thought because the Fed had raised interest rates faster and more steeply than um, than in the last 40 years that for sure there was going to be a recession, right? How could aggressive. there not be is what they thought. Yeah. We didn't think that, you know. Oh, we were right, of course. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, you know, if you go back to when you and I, we, people can, you can fact check us on this because we we did a, um, a show, a, a talk in front of Rossmore in Walnut Creek. Uh -huh. uh, and it's we have it on our archives. You can look it up. Um, and we talked about this where people were predicting that we were going to have a recession in October of 2022. Mm -hmm. And we said... Nobody knows. We don't know. You yeah. know, it may, maybe not, but it's not a definite, you yeah. know, and now uh, it's funny because a year and a half later, almost, they're still predicting for this year. Guess what? A recession. <laughs> they don't give up. It's always, they're always predicting, you know, the bottom is going to fall out and yeah. it's going to be terrible, terrible, terrible. Well, I'm sorry, but markets are calm and everything is fine is not exactly good news. No. Who's going to tune into that? 
it's not the news they want to they want to talk about for yeah, sure. It's yeah, it's not good programming. It's great news, really, but they don't want to talk about right. it. Right. Yeah, not good programming. Right. <laughs> so we want to share with you some of the wonderful quotes that were made by uh, market pundits over the last several years. I take pleasure in saving these oh, for future. <laughs> and now I've got them and we're going to we're going to we're going to give them to you. So, so don't listen to the market pundits unless it's us making the prediction because we were right. And you could take our prediction. You'll see. Just our prediction is going to be accurate and you'll see. <sighs> Okay, okay, so let's go um, October 2022 when we gave that presentation right. where we were like, well, here's the economic data. Maybe, right. maybe not. Right. Um, we have, uh, okay, so first up, billionaire hedge fund manager, Paul Tudor Jones. He manages a $12 million fund. His claim to fame is accurately predicting the October 1987 uh, market crash. It's, and just it's for Black Grimm's. Monday. Even a stopped watch is is right, uh, you know, twice, twice a, day, a day, right? That's so right. there you go. Yeah. So. so like he, you know, he's been um, the guy. But since then, his predictometer has been slightly off um, and his returns have dimmed. And in October of 2022, he said that the U.S. was either near or already in a recession. And, and as we know that. Not true. Happened. Not true. Yeah. That same month, Citigroup. Large bank in the United States cut its year-end S&P 500 uh, for target to 4,000, and they predicted a down market in, for, in, for stocks in 2023. Again, <laughs> sorry. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Morgan Stanley, they're big. They had to have been, right? Right? Yep. Morgan Stanley. All right. So on January 12th of 2023, they come out of the woodwork, and they call for a double-digit drop in stocks during the first part of the year. This is great. Instead, they went up by double digits, 14% between January 12th and the end of July. Yeah. They did the exact opposite of what Morgan said. Again. Yeah. Okay, on April 9th of last year, 2023, Jeffrey Gundlach, who is the founder of the uh, large double line investment uh, portfolio, said, <laughs> these are kind of funny. Um, he saw a red alert recession signal and predicted the Fed would start cutting rates soon. It's now nine months later, no, no recession ever appeared, no rate cuts have occurred, and one hopes that he canceled his red alert recession alert <laughs> signal because if his investors were relying on that, they didn't make, they didn't participate in the 24% stock market returns of last year. That would be a shame. Yeah. So he gets an end also for that call. Hey, you see what happens when you make these things? I mean, yeah. 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 I, I guess someone has to. I mean, those guys are probably sitting there going, no, someone has to. to. Exactly. You don't have to. You can just point to, to the historical data and say, yeah. we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the next one year, but we have no reason to believe it will be any different from the last 50 years. Right. But that's right. boring. I'm not tuning into that. So, right. you know. Yeah. You have to go off the air because who's going to pay for advertising on that? Hey, um, remember last year when all of these banks went down and our economy was going to completely Thank crash? You. And China was going to take us over. Mm -hmm. Remember all that? Yep, it's so yep. funny how it just. Whew. Now, a lot of us are still suffering the impact. Like, I'm not a fan of being a Chase customer from First Republic. But, yeah, you know, true. Um, I think the big deal, though, is that we thought we were going to see the most epic commercial real estate crash in history. And that has not come to pass. We have seen some softening in certain markets like downtown San Francisco. You know, you've got a lot of vacancies, yeah. but it was not the epic crash that anybody predicted going to happen. And in fact, REITs, real estate investment trusts, a lot of you, our clients have them in your portfolios. Many people use them. They're actually positive. Uh, yeah. So imagine that <laughs> they're positive. I don't have to imagine it's real. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, in October of 2023, the wall street journal came out. I can't believe they did this, but they said they have to write something, right? The 60-40 investment portfolio, which if you, for those of you who don't know, 60-40 portfolio is 60% stocks and 40% fixed income like bonds and money markets and things like that, cash. That's been a staple of the investment world since before I started in the, in the, Stone, Ages. In the Stone Ages, in the Cro-Magnon era. Um, <laughs> And, <laughs> and do you even remember that word? Pleistocene era, or whatever it was. You know what? How do you remember? I don't know. This? It's, that thing stick in my mind. Jeez. Don't talk to me about what happened yesterday. But you know. Oh um, so anyway, it's been a staple for a long time because it makes keeps people. It's a safe. You know, it's a it's a conservative portfolio. Um, the Wall Street Journal said it was dead. The sixty forty portfolio it actually was dead. It wasn't. It was just not useful anymore. It didn't protect people. It didn't do anything. Yet it turns out that one month later, one month they should have waited a month to publish oh that, and they would have just caught themselves. It. But one month later, the sixty forty portfolio actually had its best month 
since 2020. So not to worry, folks, the 20, the 60, 40 portfolio <laughs> is still very much alive <laughs> and well, and reports of its early demise were premature. What are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to talk about the the um, prediction that I hope you'll ignore this year because this Please. one is a fresh one. And if you have been listening to the things we have been saying, <laughs> so uh, crypto execs are back. I guess they need some money and they're going to start employing <laughs> the greater fool theory because they're predicting that Bitcoin is going to go to a hundred thousand this year. Yeah. They are predicting, predicting. Yeah. Yeah, which almost guarantees it's going to go to 1,000. Good luck with that. But anyway, you know, if these, these data you go in one air, out the other, really, you know. Mm -hmm. So you just can't make this stuff up, honestly, you know. And it begs the question, why would anybody ever listen to these people? You know, why? We always, we, their market predictions are not going to be accurate, so why should we listen to them? Our answer, of course, is we shouldn't. We've been saying this for a long time. The media publishes these things because they're salacious and they're eye-catching. As Angela just said, they're not going to say, hey, another year, it's going to be good. Don't right. worry about it. Right. Sit back and go live your life. You know, but the, the thing that's bad about it is they never come back and tell you when these predictions that were made before, how they how they right. worked out. Right. So you, you know? keep following. Them. So you can know. You're just like, oh, we're just gonna, they trot the same guys out again, saying the same things, predicting the worst. And not, yeah. no one's ever held accountable. It's, you you know? know, I have to say, I'm becoming more and more angry about this. That maybe, is this what happens when you start to get old like you just get angry about things and then yeah. you can't stop like i'm tired every, of this. i'm not gonna take it anymore that's how i feel yeah. about this because the number of folks even clients that came to us in the beginning of last year and said i'm just really worried about the markets i'm watching the news mm -hmm. i don't want to get back in or take me out and i said well when would be the time and and i had a client actually say to me when things calm down. <laughs> and I and I thought, you know, when would that person ever see things calm down because they watch the news? It's never calm on the news, you know? And so I would actually argue that these financial medias are are doing investors a huge disservice because this one person in particular, they kept him out of the market and they kept him from making 24%. He yeah. kept his money in a savings account because of what was happening on the news. Yep. Yeah. That is irresponsible. Yep. And of course, he probably wants to get in now that the markets are up 24%, right? Of course he does. Right? Of course when he, he should have gotten in. I mean, it's fine to get in now. Because they're calm now. I guess, or they're not right now. We're at the beginning of the year. The markets are down. So he's going to wait again, Fresh probably. crisis. Let's it's wait like, again. Yeah. Oh, I hate you all so much. It's really much. annoying. <laughs> you know, there should be a class action lawsuit against the media and say, we're gonna, the whole the whole United States is going to sue you because of your, because we rely on your stupid advice that you never get held accountable First for. Amendment, right? And it kills I people's say whatever future. I want. Yeah. That's right. what they'll use. You know, so yeah. uh, did you know, let me just bust this one wide open, <laughs> that anyone can pay to publish an article in Forbes magazine. Anyone? Yeah. Wow. Anyone. If you just write a check? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, they say they're vetting you, but Forbes wants their money, so they're not. And we have been prospected by Forbes. We, this is why I know this. If yeah, you pay this amount true. of money, I will publish your article. So I know many of you listening to this podcast right now, read Forbes magazine and you think of it at all of those writers as credible all experts. Yeah. All they, a lot, some are, of course, there are staff writers and there are experts and some of the advisors that are putting articles out there. Some of it is correct and good information, but I want you to know that they bought that article. They are there to advertise their business to you, to put that Forbes article print out on their wall and say, look, look who I am. we were published in Forbes. You should My definitely put your money with us. They bought that. Yep, yep. Okay, I'm going to calm No, down it's now. true. It's <laughs> all very true. It's all very true. <laughs> and on that same topic, we all know who Jim Cramer is, right? He's the crazy guy, you know, mad money on CNBC. Yeah. And he breaks things and throws things around and all that stuff. You know, we talked about him last year and we were laughing because we we, we did an analysis of his um, prediction, predictions from the prior period of time. And he was wrong more than half the time. The S&P 500 would have dramatically outperformed his picks. But, you know, people follow. So they came out with an ETF. We were laughing about the ETF yeah. that tracks yeah. his, you know, and so they actually, it only lasted for five months. They had to shut it down because <laughs> the returns were so terrible. It was only, it only made 2%. And so they <sighs> just said, we're, we're, we're shutting it down. Yeah. So, you know, again, Jim Cramer, all the press he gets. Yeah. There's no there there, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you cannot predict. I know we all want the comfort of saying someone must know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen in the short term. Nobody knows. We do know the long term is going to be great. Right? All signs point to. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah. no change from his forward and backwards. Path. They all point to that. So here's going back to our original article that we started with at the top of the show by James McIntosh, bless his soul, um, bless his heart. He said uh, to wisely invest in 2024, we have to decide why the economy defied expectations in 2023. No, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. You don't need to know any of that stuff. All you have to do is invest your money and stay invested. Ignore all the so-called more experts and avoid trying to time the market or trying to be cute and understand what's going on in the markets today because it doesn't matter. Yep. You're in for the long term. Yep. Let me tell you a client story. Yeah, you please. Story, yeah, obviously. Let me tell you all a client story. <laughs> so we like to refer to this woman as the canary in the mine shaft. She has been with you for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And anytime, it's not anytime the markets are moving, it's when the news is up about the markets moving yeah. that this client calls us. And so that's, we use her to kind of judge the mood of what's going on. If she's calling, the news is out, people are worried, right? Yep. Yep. And so it was so interesting. The last time that you talked to her, you told her that the day, um, she started working with us. The Dow was at 10,000, right? Yep. And then- 2001, today, I think. Yeah. Yep. That adds up. Yep. yep. So yep. then today it's at 37,000, right? If the market performs exactly the same way that it did over the next 20 years, the Dow will be at 137,000 in 2046. It's just math. It's just math. Yeah. So what is to be accomplished by, you know- worrying about the day-to-day -day gyrations of the market. And before you say, no, that's not possible. The Dow will never hit 137,000. We thought it would never hit 10,000. We thought it would never hit 37,000. We didn't. <laughs> Some people did. Yeah. No, I read yeah. Irrational Exuberance oh, in okay. like 2000. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, I really, yeah. I have no doubt. If it just goes up by 11% a year or whatever, it's going to be there. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, there's no, I have no question in my mind. So why so should we worry about your, the day-to-day -day or whatever? Who cares? Wait, so what is your prediction for 2020? Oh, okay. Da, 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 da. The prediction, <laughs> our market prediction is first and only time you're ever going to hear this probably in our, in our history. <laughs> uh, the stock market in 2024 is going to fluctuate. Oh. That's all we can guarantee, folks. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> Annual performance is meaningless anyway. It doesn't mean anything. It's really just too short of a time frame to make to draw any kind of logical conclusions about the validity of what you're doing. Right. You know, as far as your your investment uh, portfolio and your asset allocation. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a long game. We need way longer. Sometimes they even say five years is too short of a period to be to get yeah. statistical, uh, you know, uh, important, uh, reliable information. Right. The only way to make sense out of this whole thing is just to think long term, keep putting as much money as you can into equities and relax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to pay off. It yeah. never has not paid off. Right. Right. And if you're not staying in, if you're coming and going, I mean, if you miss the last two months of the year. You missed it all. Two months, the yeah. whole thing recovered in two months. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Yeah. We had a, we had a lady that um, will na remain nameless. She was, had money in, she was kind of new investor and I knew she was a little squirrely, squirrely, squirrely but she, um, she got nervous and it was um, March, I think 14th mm -hmm. of this last year. She called and said, you got to get me out. I want to go into a CD. Why are you doing this? My sister-in-law said, you know, it's going to blah, 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 blah. You know, so she got out. It turns out in hindsight, that was the very lowest point of the year mm -hmm. in stocks. Had mm -hmm. she just waited one more day to pull the trigger, she would have started feeling better because it started going up. Mm -hmm. And she missed out on the whole year because she got panicky. Mm -hmm. And her brilliant advisors and her family mm -hmm. told her, oh, it's bad. This is really bad. This is a unprecedented and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and it turns out it wasn't, yeah. it was just fine. Yep. There was nothing. <sighs> wow. Moving on. Yeah. Okay. Did you know? <laughs> what? <laughs> you do know. And I want you to tell everyone how it is possible to still get a 3% mortgage rate. Can you? You can. If you have a time machine you or know something, how. You go back in time. Tell them how to do it. All right. It. You can actually this do this. Amazing. It's really true. You can actually get 3% is even high. You could probably get 2.7% because um, because that's some of those mortgages are out there. You probably know that when you, that most mortgages, well, all, almost all mortgages, when you sell your house or transfer it to somebody else, the mortgage becomes 
due and payable. It's called a due on sale clause or due on transfer clause. That was put into effect in 1982 by Congress. The, the Garn Act is what it's called. Your buddy. <laughs> My buddy, yeah, uh, Jake Garn. And um, it required that to happen. So I don't know what the cause, what the point was. But there are some loans, though, that are still assumable. That means you can you can buy the house and you can take over the mortgage from the person who has the mortgage now. And not old loans. They just carved out certain kinds of loans. Right. So right. they're still possible. So loans through the FHA, through the United States Department of Agriculture. I don't even know they made loans. They, they did, but they those, <laughs> they do for some rural kind of lands. Yeah. And the Veterans Administration. So if you can get a, buy a house from someone who has one of those mortgages, you can take over, you can assume their loan and take over their payments. How about that? Mm -hmm. And, um, but you have to qualify and it's really, really hard to qualify. So for the VA, let me make sure I get this right. So for the, you're going to laugh all FHA and VA, let's see, uh, USDA and VA loans. You need a credit score of at least 620, kind of hard to make, right? 620. Yeah. Break. Yep. And Those for the FHA, buying their homes are in this area. For the FHA, it's 580. I mean, you could go, you almost, you could have a, a recent bankruptcy yep. and still be at 580. So, you know, um, the trick is to find houses that have these loans. So um, it's not common knowledge. And in the real estate market, I don't think it's caught on yet that sellers who want to have a VA or one of these loans actually has a big leg up on everybody else because you can take over their loan mm -hmm. and get financing at, at the low, low, low rate that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and so once I think once they find out, they could, you know, if I was if I had a three percent mortgage or two point seven. I would be wanting to sell my house to you for a higher price uh, yeah. because even adjusted for the paying the higher price, you take over my payments, your payments are still going to be lower than getting a 7% mortgage today. Mm -hmm. Way lower. Yeah. Way, way, way lower. Yeah. So um, the, what you need to do is get a good realtor and find out, you know, tell the realtor, I'm, I'm interested in talking to anybody who's got a loan that, uh, you know, one of these F government loans that was uh, issued prior to 2022 yeah. when the rates were low. And anyone who's buying a house should just ask yeah. what kind of loan the current owner has, because you might find out you're buying your home from yep. a veteran. Yep. Unless you think these, these aren't out, like who has an FHA loan? Remember the financial crisis? A lot of people have FHA oh, yeah. loans. A Tons lot. Of them. Anybody who didn't want to put 20% down has an FHA loan and might still have it if they didn't refi. Here, one of our employees got a VA loan only two years ago. If he wanted to sell his house, you could assume his loan at his amazing interest rate. Yeah. So this is, it's out there totally. They are available and you could get your kids in these loans. You just have to be smart and you yeah. got to look for them. You got to yeah. dig, you got a needle in the you haystack. Ask your realtor. But you know, they're there and you should, you know, I think you could even buy rentals like that. Right. I mean, why would, who, who say you can't, I can't see, I don't know. Not. We have to see. Yeah. But I, I would be trying to do that. I mean, I'm just telling you, this is, this is a, something that not people is not widely known and you heard it here first. <laughs> so if it. you make money, let us know. <laughs> you can come invest it with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, okay. you, why yeah. would you not? Of course they're there for they're just right for the taking. Yep. So no okay. questions to ask. topic change. Okay. If you have a kid that's heading to college this year, you're probably thinking about financial aid. And what a lot of us assume is that we put our little numbers into the, the FAFSA system and the college spits back out uh, some sort of offer and we can accept or reject that offer. Did you know that you can negotiate Get college out. financial aid packages? Absolutely, you Oof. can negotiate these things. There are, you know... There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, actually, that none of us ever hear about. Right. And, and so, but how do you do that? Like, I, you know, as a regular old Joe parent, I don't know how what I'm supposed to be asking for. So we're going to give you two resources that you can go do some research and figure out what kind of financial aid packages the schools you're looking at or that have accepted are giving to other students. And you can request an adjustment. And it never hurts to ask. It's like Absolutely. a 20 minute research and email, you know? Know? Yep. So, okay. One site is meritmore.com. That's M-E-R-I-T-M-O-R-E. -E, and it gives you stats on the average merit-based uh, financial aid package that each school is providing, as well as the average need-based. So you get all that data. So imagine you're going in like to a negotiation <laughs> or you're playing poker. Let's yeah. do that. You're playing poker and you can see what cards the other person has. How about that? Yeah. Turn the tables on those schools. Oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and they even have a future, like a feature you can enter your kids' SAT, ACT scores, their GPA, and then you can instantly see how much financial aid the schools would offer you based on that as well. 
Another website you can look at is Tuition Fit tuitionfit.com. Treat it like, treat that one like a second opinion after using Merit More. But this data is out there and you should be using it to your advantage. Did you say you can enter in the SAT and all that? Yeah. You already said that? Yeah. Okay. Where I should listen better. Do you have a senior moment? Probably. <laughs> I was thinking of the next topic, which is really interesting about throwing away food. Uh, how does this relate to my finances? Because if you're throwing away food, you're wasting money. Tell Americans me waste, you should see how, wait till you see these stats, how much money we waste on food that we end up throwing away. So we're talking, of course, about food expiration dates. According to the Wall Street Journal, food experts really, they broadly agree that um, the expiration dates on every box of crackers and beans and bag of apples uh, pretty much squanders your money, mm -hmm. th throws away perfectly good food and fills up the landfills needlessly. First of all, those dates on those packages are not about the safety of the food. You think that they are. But they say things like fresh until, display until, best when used by, better if used by, sell by, enjoy by, or even just they have a date on them with no words at all. Those dates are not, they're really about telling retailers when to rotate the stock on the shelves, mm -hmm. not about whether the food is good. If anything, they are, they're more indic indicative of when the products are at peak mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. But then they've got a long tail, as you said, mm -hmm. with the preservatives we have nowadays. <laughs> oh. They could still be good in 150 years, yeah. you know, some of those things. It's not great for us. So they're, to their credit, the food manufacturers have tried in vain to try to educate people. You, I don't know how hard they tried because you know, the more food you throw away, the more money they make. But they say they've tried really hard um, to explain that it's about peak quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but most foods will, will last way longer than that. So something that was meant to be a guide, a helpful guide for consumers ends up being a rule mm. that people think that they have to live by. <laughs> and so the most current thinking is to have, a, we should be having a use by date on packages that indicate storage for things like fresh milk, mm -hmm. you know, uh, deli meats, things like that. That's when you need it, right? Yeah, because it you know, go bad. can actually go bad. Johns Hopkins University has found that 84% of US consumers throw out food at the package date, at least occasionally, and 37% of consumers do it always or frequently <laughs> or usually, sorry. So I just want to say- Yeah, talk about your mom. <laughs> vindicated. Italian <laughs> mothers everywhere. This is your moment. <laughs> I was just joking on the last episode about how we go into my poor mother's house and we all make a game out of going through her pantry and her fridge to see who can find the oldest expiration date. And then guess what? We throw all that food away. I'm so sorry, mom. You were right. Just screenshot that. So, <laughs> so, so Winnie, get your checkbook out and figure out how much, get your calculator out and figure out how much your daughter is throwing sorry. food away, how much she costs you from that. <laughs> It will never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> Experts say the best way to protect yourself from unsafe food is by eating unsafe food is to you is to um, ignore the best buy dates and instead keep your refrigerator set at 37 degrees. Oh, store enough. it properly. Store it properly. <laughs> things, things that get too hot, they do go bad. But they said that even though uh, old food will taste bad, it's still really unlikely to be dangerous, especially if you cook it afterwards. Yeah. So legal alert, we're not telling you your food is fine after the ex after that date. We're not food experts. We're just telling you what the Wall Street Journal and these experts said, okay? <laughs> this is my CYA moment here. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, we're throwing a lot of stats at you, estimates that 31% of the available food supply goes uneaten, 31%. Yes. Retailers throw away 41 billion pounds of, of food Annually, I can't even conceptualize while that. While consumers throw away another 90 billion pounds How, of food. Can you food. put that in normal terms? Yeah, it like works out to um, uh, 8.7 pounds per week per, per consumer, per household. And uh, it's 387, I don't know who does these calcs, 387 billion calories that gets thrown away per year, enough to feed every American 1,250 calories. And it just gets thrown to away. To abolish gone, poverty, wasted. basically. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah, pretty amazing, right? Poverty, sorry. But there's hope. What? what? <laughs> Hunger. Sorry, not poverty. <laughs> uh, there's hope, though, that in the UK, uh, they have they've done away with a lot of these things. That they've, the stores have gotten rid of hundreds of labels like that. And as a result of those getting rid of those, those labels, uh, the waste has gone down by 18% a year. Wow. 
That's food, food getting thrown away. So there's hope. Yeah. We might be able to do that. But in the meantime, you're now empowered. Don't worry about those labels. You know, I mean, I think if the can you have is starting to separate, on, and it's, use your it's head. swollen. See, this is why the labels exist, because you know, some person from a state that shall remain nameless. <laughs> yeah, don't go there. <laughs> we have people in that state. <laughs> no, it's like some person ate some bad yogurt and now, you know, there's. Yeah, yeah. But swollen <laughs> containers. Oh, you know, that you pop open and they go, boom, you know, that might be that. something that's got a little but, bit. Okay. I'm our retirees out there on a fixed budget. Like, yeah. you know, you don't need to buy a new balsamic vinaigrette unless ever like mold on it. Never okay, mold on it or something. I don't even know then. All right. So okay. moving on, moving on. We talked, we talk a lot about bad news, bad news, bad news, but there are some cool things that happen in 2023. Sure. And I just want to say them out loud because we need to put some positive news into the world. So positive spin. Yeah. So, you know, um, this, this all came out of this great Wall Street Journal article that Zachary Carabell wrote. Thank you for that. There was a big health breakthrough this year with weight loss medications like Ozempic and people are having tremendous success losing weight. Um, not just for that fact, but it improves all of your numbers when you lose weight. So we're we're making strides towards diabetes, towards heart disease. People are feeling better about themselves, looking better, yeah. getting out there. Ultimately, this reduces the cost of medical services for all of us. So right. this is a really good thing. Right. Got to get the cost of those drugs down, but Yeah, it's true. I think there's some you know, so there's some issues yeah. at play. Let's a lot not of deny that, but yeah. it's ultimately, you know, Thinning America out will help us. Um, We're solving problems that we created, though, by overeating, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, Speaking of solving problems we created in climate (laughs) news. Yeah, how about that? So there's actually some pretty decent climate news. The hole in the ozone layer. I don't think it's gone. It's it's gone completely. Like, we don't have to worry about that as we did before. And um, U.S. carbon emissions have decreased by 25% per capita since 07. Globally, emissions have flatlined since 2017. Um, A Pew poll found that a third of Americans, only a third of Americans think enough is being done. We certainly do have a long way to go, but there is improvement and we just don't talk about it enough. So things are getting better. Yeah. Um, And then we have all of this, you know, we're moving towards digitization. We've got um, solar, wind and heat pumps. We're changing the way that we use energy, which will help our climate, of course. Yep. Um, okay, for Americans, the best news, we did not have a recession last year. We really talked about this. Yeah, that's big. I think something interesting here, like no one under the age of 30 believes that, like they believe alternative facts. You got to write to me if you're under 30 and you don't believe that there wasn't a recession. I'm really curious. What Whether we're think. still in one. But there's data there so yeah. that speaks to that. So yeah. that's how we consume and then what we do with that. This, young, this generation may change. Yeah, what yeah. happens? Yeah. Um, but- Real GDP grew by 2.6%. Unemployment is back to its lows of 2019. Uh, wage gains in many industries are outpacing inflation, actually. That's um, big. Stellar stock market, which boosted the savings for, you know, 150 million Americans. Um, so we've got our Goldilocks moment in the economy. Yep. Higher interest rates for savings, at least. you know, all that, yes. right? Yes. So there's a lot of good things going on. So many good things. And then, of course, we would be remiss if we didn't give you some of the new savings limits for 2024. So the IRS is hooking us up once again. We can put more money into these accounts. So I'm going to run you through what you can do for 2024. If you are contributing to a 401k or a 403b at work, you can put in 23000 this year via deferral. If you're over 30 years old, you can do 30000 over 50 years old, you can do 30,500, 23,000 or 30,005 if you're over 50. If you are contributing to an IRA or a Roth IRA, it's $7,000 or 8,000 if you're over 50. If you are making more than 146,000 as a single person or 230,000 as married people, you cannot contribute direct, directly to a Roth. So those are your new income limits. You would do a backdoor Roth instead. You can ask us about that. If you're doing a solo 401k or an individual 401k, you can go up to $69,000 this Ooh. year. Those are If you are self-employed and do not have employees, don't skip this. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> it's massive. And then if you're over 50, that number is 76,500. SEP IRAs, you can do uh, 25% of your income up to a limit of 69,000 for the year. There's no catch up on SEP IRAs. 
HSA contributions, that's the health savings account. If you have a uh, self-only plan, you can contribute $4,150. If you have a family plan, you can put $8,300 into an HSA this year. That is tax deductible when you put it in and no tax on any of that earnings if you pull it out to pay for medical expenses. So it's like the best IRA combo in the world. Nothing else I know is and tax-free going in plan, and tax-free coming out. That's pretty big. Yep. Um, just so you know, like how you uh, qualify for a high deductible health plan this year, it's a $1,600 deductible for a self only or $3,200 for family. Many of you are hitting that and you qualify as a high deductible health plan. That or more, right? Yeah, yeah. or more, of okay. course. Yep. All right. Whew. Whew. So if you're doing, so one thing on that, if you're doing monthly savings into an IRA, you got to bump it this year. If you yeah. want to hit the max, you yeah. need to change that every January. Yeah. Same for your 401ks. And well. you definitely should. Yes, absolutely. Right. Right. So you can convince you about the stock markets like the rest of us. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us for our first episode of 2024. It was fun. (laughs) We hope that you will not listen to any predictions this year. We hope we're leaving things on kind of a positive note with the news that was actually up for last year. Um, As always, if you would like to reach out to us, you can do so at info at a place of possibility. If you'd like to schedule a meeting to discuss your finances or anything we talked about today, you can click on the link um, in the show notes or on your screen to schedule a meeting with us. We're still offering a copy of the investment answer. It's how we invest client portfolios. It's a great short read. If you want to know more about how that sausage is made, we highly encourage you to grab a copy of that. Uh, What else do we need to say? Like and subscribe wherever you are listening. You won't miss a show. That's right. (laughs) Take us out. (laughs) So we'll see you again in two weeks. And until then, remember, you're invested and so are we. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.